Let's open our Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 1. <coughs> we'll be looking at the ministry of one man, the Apostle Paul. I would say, really, the threefold ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we are, we've been looking at verses 21, and today we'll be looking into chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The ministry of the Apostle Paul. As I've been uh, chewing on the truths that he brings here, I realized that, uh, as the Apostle Paul says, the, the reason why he could go so far and do so much was not because he was a great man, it was because he depended on the enablement of the Lord Jesus Christ, as, he, as we will see later on. It was not his power flowing through, making uh, these wonderful uh, changes in and, uh, and the people get encountered, and, and in the disciples, he was, as he says, it is the power of God that flows uh, mightily, dynamos, uh, with dynamite, with uh, dynamite power in his, in his life. So let's read um, verses 21, and we're looking all the way into chapter 2, verse 3, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and you that were sometimes alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprobable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the, of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I call and made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Praise the Lord for that. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, notice now, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Who's doing all this, he says? Not me. It is him. It's all about him. In him are all the treasures hidden. And he says, I go to that treasure and I pull out from there everything that I need. Verse 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great affliction, what great conflict I have for you, and for them that are that for them and love you there, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might, uh, might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom all, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's how we pray. Father, this is a heavy, packed passage. If we break it down to bite-sized portions, we realize, Lord, tell me how much we have in Christ, how much you've given us. And we see that you are a, an endless well in which we can always dip in and receive blessing. And we need your blessing this afternoon, Lord. We need you. We don't need creeds. We don't need rules. We all these things are wonderful, Lord, in their position, in their place. But we need a person. We need the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul says, in whom are hid all the treasures. We need to go in there, Lord, and just take a few more blessings. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage this afternoon a little closer, we will draw some wonderful truths that, Lord, will help us in our Christian walk. It will make us more complete, more perfect, more to the image, more, com more confirmed to the image of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me also with my language. Sometimes I get 
I get a little um, stuck in trying to translate my thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you will make the difference there also. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The ministry of one man, the threefold ministry, and we've seen here, first of all, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that one of his ministries was sharing the gospel. If you read with me again, look at verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies on your mind, this is where you were before, it says, uh, <clears throat> by, uh, by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled. Not that God did anything wrong, that he had to reconcile himself with mankind. It was the other way around. God never did anything wrong. It was man that sinned and fell short. But Paul he says, I am made a minister of reconciliation. Uh, and uh, verse 22, in the body of, of his flesh through death, to present you holy. This is my ministry. This is, this is uh, my job now that you are in Christ. I want my job is to uh, train you, to teach you. Uh, in, another, in another place, he puts it like to iron you, to take all the wrinkles out, all the spots. Uh, I, want you to, I want to present you as a, a wonderful, spotless bride uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he emphasizes here in verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So we see there Paul in his ministry. He says, this is where you were before, lost, alienated, enemies. And this is what the gospel has done in your life. Now you're near. He's reconciled you. Now you can be in his presence. And then in verse 23, look at verse 23, it says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from, notice this word, the hope of the gospel. What is the hope of the gospel? The gospel gives us hope that one day, if we receive Christ, we'll be in the presence of God. So it talks about his future glorification, their past alienation, their present reconciliation, and their future glorification. Paul says, I have a part in that. Now that's a wonderful thing. We can have a part in the life of many people, but you know, having a part this way is life changing. And so that's one of his ministries. And then he goes on in verse 24 through 27 saying, telling us about the suffering that he does. He says, I, I go through strife, I, I go through very difficult times. And for you, the Gentiles, look at verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So he's going through suffering. He says, I'm suffering not just because of Jesus Christ, because I'm following him. This is the consequences of following the Lord. You will suffer persecution. You will suffer difficulties. But then he says that he suffers because of the Gentiles. He says, I'm a minister. God has called me to be a minister to the Gentiles. Now, when the Gentiles heard this for the first time, they were amazed, they were, they were surprised, and they were happy. The Jews were angry, but the, the Gentiles said, you mean that this, we can also be part of this? And they received Christ. The Jews rejected, and so Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles. And so he's suffering there because of Christ, because of the Gentiles, and because of the sake of the body, the church, he says, I rejoice in this suffering. And he's thinking about the benefits of this ministry. He's not thinking about what, how hard it is to me. He's thinking about, you know, what blessing this is going to bring. Similar to what we find in the book of Hebrews, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, looking and saying, saying that on, while he was on the cross, he was, uh, he was joyful because he was looking to the future, to you and to me thinking what benefit the cross is going to do to, for us. And so uh, we see there the second ministry, the sufferings for the Gentiles. Paul talks about this not with, re, uh, with regret, but he re rejoices in this. And then verses 25 and 27, he talks about his responsibility. Paul had been made a minister by God. Not, he had not um, done this on himself. He was, he was given a stewardship, an administration. It was not a matter of choice. He was called to fulfill the Word of God. This is where we've left it. But there's one more point I'd like to go through before we go to the next section, before we go deeper into chapter 2. 
The third ministry is striving for the saints. And if you will, let's check verses 28 and then and 29, and then we'll read the first few verses of chapter 2. Whom we preach, warning every man, three times it says this to make emphasis, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. It's not being redundant, it's just saying, I want to make sure that you understand that this is my, I'm not going to leave out anyone. My job is that anyone, anyone that comes with an open ear, with a willingness, with an open heart, if that would be possible, because the Holy Spirit needs to do the work of, the, of that, to open hearts and then open the understanding. But it says, my job is to present the, minute, the, the, the gospel, to present this, this, uh, this administration to those who have come across. Verse 29, whereunto I was also, uh, I also labor. These two words, labor and striving, comes from a, a word, uh, it's agonia, agonamosai, something like that. Uh, Magnus is uh, learning Greek very soon, I'll be, able, I'll be uh, asking him how to pronounce it. But, and, you know, this is the agonamosai, it comes from the word agony. Just I'm agonized like an athlete. It's hard work. But it says, I'm doing this. Whereunto I also labor, it's a hard job, I'm agonized, it's striving according to the, his working. And when you get the, the, the power, the dynamite, the mega power to be able to do this, a process which worketh in me mightily, it is his power. Sometimes we think about the, about the Apostle Paul, we say, wow, what a great man to us. If Paul was standing here right now, he says, you got it all wrong. It is not me, it is the mega power of God in me. Don't look at Paul, look at Jesus Christ in me. He is the one to be glorified. So this is what he's pushing uh, through this letter. Don't be thinking about me and the ministry that I have. It is God's ministry given to me, but it, uh, enabled by the Holy Spirit. It is his power. And then chapter 2, verse 1, For I would that you knew what greater conflict I have for you, and for them, them, not just for you over there in Colossae, but also in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. One day we will see Paul. What are you going to say to Paul, John, when you, when you come face to face with him in heaven? Have you ever thought about that? One day we'll meet Paul. You know what I'm going to say? Paul, thank you for giving us an example. A mega example. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Paul, for showing us how things are done properly. You haven't seen me, but now you see me. And now, now we can go back to what we've read about Paul and say, thank you, Paul, because now we know how this the ministry has to be done. And then in verse 2, he tries to give some comfort to the Christians who are going through persecution, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father. You can see these are heavy, packed verses. So the only way I, I see that we can catch anything here, that we can understand it by breaking this down to bite-sized pieces. So let's do that. We've met Paul the preacher, sharing the gospel, and Paul the prisoner, suffering for the Gentiles. Now we meet Paul the prayer warrior, striving in prayer for the individual saints that might be mature in the faith. And here we find now uh, how he does, how he's uh, doing his ministry. I want you to uh, pay attention to some words that uh, Paul uses here. So he says, whom, verse 28, uh, whom we preach, he says. But did not proclaim uh, precepts. He did not come to bring a creed or uh, a code of ethics, or rules and regulations. Now we need rules and regulations for sure, but that's not what he came to do. He didn't just come to give us some uh, religion, come to teach us some religious rituals. He didn't even come to give us a plan or a program. He said, I've come here to bring you a person. I want you to understand that it's all in him. All the treasures are in him. Look at verse 10. For you are complete in Him. He is the one that we need to be focusing all the time. Every time you think that maybe there's something missing in your Christian life, maybe you need to go somewhere else to find it. You don't need to go anywhere else. You need to go to Christ. In all the treasures 
are that have hidden him. If we haven't found them, it's because we haven't dug deep enough. And then he uses the word warning. He, he says, this is how I do it. This is how I try to bring people to him. This is, I give them warning. I preach the gospel, give them warning. That is, addressing, admonishing the heart. Reproving and convicts, convincing of error. This refers to the conduct. And the conduct that leads to repentance. And then he uses this word teaching. This is another way that he does this. Addressing an inter the, the intellect. Informing. Instructing in faith. In faith and morals. And this is and talking about, refers to the doctrine. This is how I do it. I teach them the truth. And then what is the goal? He says that I may present. That refers to Paul's aim and purpose. This is what, this is, I know my goals. I know where I'm going. Sometimes we get up in the morning and we think, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do today? You know, Paul didn't have to ask that. He says, I know what I'm going to do today. It's all, I just have to focus on Jesus Christ and I just have to keep on doing what he told me to do. He didn't have to guess his way through the day. He says, my aim is already settled. My purpose in life is Jesus. For me to live is rules and regulation, religious ritual. You know, is that what he said? He said, no, for me to live is Christ. You know, we, I repeat this so often, I hope maybe after 1,000 times we might get it. And who is he aiming to bring this wonderful message to? Notice there it says, every man, and repeats it three times. This is repeated three times for emphasis. Warning every man, teaching every man, we uh, that we may present every man, verse 28. Paul well, has no uh, narrow... Uh, exclusiveness, such as the, the Gnostics, the Gnostics will come and say, no, no, it's about us. It's about the, uh, you know, if you want to be really complete, you need, you need to go beyond Christ and just follow our teaching, our philosophy, just follow us, and we will give you that full fulfillment. Jesus says, uh, in, in opposition, he says, uh, they won't be able to give you the, uh, any fulfillment. The fulfillment is always in Christ. And what is Paul's goal? Notice the next for a few words, per, that we may present you perfect in Jesus Christ. That's his aim. Uh, not sinless, but perfect, complete, full grown, mature. You're here this afternoon, you think, well, what does the Lord want uh, for me? You know what he wants for you? And for me, he wants us to be mature. He wants us to be complete. He wants to, us to have the mind of Christ. He wants us to uh, be filled with him. And in verse 29, he uses this word unto. And Paul's, this is Paul's extended effort. And the word here in verse 29, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 29, striving, and the word conflict in chapter 2, verse 1, is an athlete's term. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh mighty in me. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he uses the word conflict. I go through great conflict. Remember I mentioned before the word, the, the word uh, in Greek where these words come from, agonimosai, is the word agony. This is the word, the word agony. How many of you have heard of this um, athlete, uh, uh, athletic discipline called a triathlon? It started sometime in in the year 2000, it's already, been, it's already 23 years old. And it started in Sydney, in Australia. It takes us, uh, the, the, the Aussies, to come up with something like that. <laughs> but the, the triathlon, they call it triathlon of the man of steel. I thought maybe I'd join one of these and see how it went, it, it would go for me. They were um, inviting um, uh, athletes to join one here in Nairobi. I said, I might just go and see how I do. Well, it's about it's, uh, this triathlon, as the word says, tri three. It's 1,500 um, uh, meters, that's a, a kilometer and a half swim. I can do that. And 40 kilometers in bis by bicycle, and then 10 kilometer race. Wow. You know, you think, well, it would take a man of steel. But Paul, in the, in, when talking about the, his spiritual race, he says, this is what we're into. It take, it'll be agonizing. I've seen some of those in television. 
And you see the athletes when they do the first 1,500 meters by swimming, that's a kilometer and a half, by the time they come out, they come out they're, they're, they're in agony. All their muscles are uh, just uh, aching. Only to get on a bicycle and do 40 kilometers more. This is about something like going from here to Marbella, a little bit less. And when you finish that, then they do 10 kilometers, run from here all the way to uh, over to Remolinos. How many, how many of you would say, yeah, that, I, I think I can do that? Well, you know, this would be a crazy thing to do, but Paul was an athlete, a spiritual athlete, and says, and it's going to be hard. For me, it's not going to be easy. But where do I get the energy? Where do I get the motivation, he says? Where, what, what is it, where am I going to draw from and able to finish my race? Verse 29, where also I, belabor, also I labor, striving according to this working, which worketh in me with dynamite. Uh, dynamos. You know the word dy dynamite, dynam dy dyna dynamo, dynamic. This is where the word comes from. The mightily, it says, uh, it's, it's dynamite power. You're not going to have it, uh, you're not going to be able to achieve it unless you have this kind of source. So teaching, he says, addressing intellect, info, you know, giving information, teaching them my aim, my purpose. This is my aim to present every man, and then uh, my my extended effort would be uh, to reach that goal, and it's going to take mega power to be able to do it. Now they ref uh, these they refer to the <coughs> strenuous effort put forth by the runner to. Uh, be able to do this. It's going to take agony. How many of us, let me see if I can draw this, bring this home. Sometimes we think, you know, as a, as a missionary, there's been times where I felt like throwing the towel. Maybe you're here and said, you know, there's been times in my Christian life where I felt like, you know, I just can't go on with this. It's just too much. It's just, it's just too hard. Especially when you're serving in ministry, week after week, month after month, year after year. I think John and Diana, probably the oldest members that we have here, apart from Brother Francisco, is being agonizing sometimes, right, John? It's, it's been difficult. How many times we thought maybe we couldn't have, you know, especially through the pandemic, I felt, you know, this is it. I don't know if we're going to have what it takes to be able to go through these three years of a pandemic with all the restrictions. I, there, there was moments I doubted and I said, Lord, it's going to take something more than just Sammy to make us go through this. And we saw the Lord come through. And the wonderful blessing now, now we're enjoying having standing, uh, having stood uh, faithful. Now the Lord's bringing people in. We're having new opportunities, new blessings. It's all because of Him. So we see Paul's instruction, whom we preach. Whom refers to, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we preach. It is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. He expands this, expands this, and he says, For we preach not ourselves. We're not here to show you how good we are. He says, But Christ Jesus our Lord. How different this is from those men sometimes who stand up in the pulpit and love to see, re receive um, recognition. Men who maybe have mega churches, wrote dozens of books have uh, several doctor's degrees, they have all these achievements and, and sometimes when they're presented in, in the congregation they say we have today da, 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 and then Dr. So-and-so he's uh, been a pastor for so many years and, and he, he pastored a church of 10,000 he's written uh, uh, 30 books and he's done this, he's traveled here he's done, and, you, and you know you feel like giving him the cross I was one time in a church where the whole church stood up and applauded this, uh, this, 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 this preacher. I stood behind and I said, you know, you know, I'm sure this man uh, deserves recognition, but it, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel that. It was going to go like this and I said, you know, if I'm going to give anybody an applause, it's going to be my Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one that deserves it. But everybody there was happy. You know, going like this, and I said, mm. I felt like walking out. You know, I just, I don't know that I couldn't really put my finger on it, but when I read this, I said, that's wrong. That's definitely wrong. 
Again, there's nothing wrong with giving recognition where recognition is due. But to bring people up to, on the pedestal and say, this is the mighty doctor in divinity so-and-so, you know, it's just, it's just something that rubs me the wrong way. But this is the kind of praise that the false teachers want. It's all about us. We have the secret. You need to come to us. We have what you need. They, need, they wanted to exalt themselves. Exalt themselves. Uh, they bring achievements. This is, we have the answers that you need. Come to us. They preach a system of teaching. But Paul preached the person. The Gnostics preach philosophy and the empty traditions from men. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So the Gnostics preach philosophy and empty traditions of men, but Paul preached and proclaimed Jesus Christ. It was as simple as that. The false teachers had lists of rules and regulations. Look at the list in chapter 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day, which are shadow things to come, but the body is Christ. If you look at chapter 2, verse 20, he says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances uh, touch not, taste not, handle not. And verse 21, I think, spells the right out. The false teacher would say, no, no, this is, the, this is how you, you achieve spirituality. Just make sure you have a good long list of do's and don'ts. Have you ever come across Christians who have no long lists like that? Well, you can't do this, you have to do this. They have, a, they have a list for everything. And when you're around them, you feel like you don't want to even breathe, just in case you breathe wrong. <laughs> don't move. Something I'm going to do. They'll, they'll find something to judge you for. The Paul says we have liberty in Christ. Now, don't understand liberty to, uh, as liberty to do whatever you want, but that's liberty to be able to do what Christ wants. Christ has given us that enablement. So, imagine a difference between the ministry of the false teachers compared to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. There is a tremendous difference. Paul not only preached the words, you know, the word preach to announce with authority as a herald, but he also warned. It was always ready. In verse 28, he uses the word warning every man. You know, sometimes we feel like giving a pat on the back and just don't 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 talk about the negative things. Don't talk about, you know, don't be calling my attention on anything. Who are you to judge? It's not that Paul was judging, he was saying, no, I just want you, there's danger, there's consequences with everything you do. So I'm here not just to teach you what is correct, but also to warn you of what's not correct. And I think uh, preachers should be bold enough to do that also, not just to bring the good feelings. You've heard of jo Joel Osteen. Is a good feeling preacher. He doesn't want to talk about anything negative. And of course, he, he has a, a church of what, 20, 30,000 people? And he has this flashy smile, you know, and just looks good on the pulpit. And people love him. And when they asked him, ask him about, how come it is that you never preach against sin? Oh, you know, there's already enough negativeness. He goes like this with his little eye. There's already enough negativeness. And, you know, I, I'm here not to. Talk about the negative, I'm here to talk to you about the positive. And he does it in such a slick way that he says, you know, that's right, that's what we need to do. Paul says, no, I'm here to warn you. I'm here to warn you that there is consequences for the type of decisions we make. <clears throat> Notice how, how he puts this in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Notice it's not just the pastor doing this. Admonishing one another. It means that you find a, cry, a, a brother who is not a sister who is not walking cor correctly, and the Lord uh, 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 
puts in your heart to do. And of course, you have to find yourself in the, the proper spiritual condition. You know, in Galatians chapter 6, if you find any brother who is found in, in, in sin, uh, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, the Bible says. But, you know, it's not just the pastor, it's, or not just the, 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 the leaders in the church, it says one another. We have a responsibility with each other. You know, if I felt, you know, you saw me maybe having a, a bad week or a bad month, and, you know, things went, I'm just struggling with, and you see that I'm, I'm kind of stumbling. How many of you would say, you know, when you, I love Brother Sammy, I think I'd like to talk to him. Maybe I can invite him to have a cup of coffee and, you know, kind of point out some things that I'm seeing. I need it too. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you very much. So Paul considered himself a spiritual mentor, kind of a father, a spiritual father to the local churches. Like those in the local churches were like his spiritual children. This is how he puts it out in 1 Corinthians 4.14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. We understand the value of that, don't we? We've had teenage kids at home. Uh, they need a training, of course, but every once in a while we need to call attention and say, listen, there's consequences in your behavior. This needs to change. And that, of course, is done in an attitude of love. With the, with the purpose of restoring such a one. But also Paul was a teacher of the truth. It is not enough to warn people. We must also teach them the positive truths of the Word of God. So I have a question for you. How far would we get in our travels if the highway signs told us where the road is not going? Get, get the, the, the turn? How, just all you see is signs you're not going to Madrid. <laughs> And you're not going to England. Uh, but you're not, well, I want to go somewhere, but all you see is signs that say, this is not taking you there. It would be very confusing. You probably wouldn't go anywhere. You need signs that says, this will take you to so and so. Now, if you have a wife like mine who doesn't know how to read maps, you might end up in Timbuktu. <laughs> She's not a good co pilot. I was praising and dancing when the first GPS came and was invented. I was finally getting there without having to spend three hours, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a trip that took three hours to get there. But, you know, there was one positive thing with her. I got to see a lot of world. I saw many towns that never thought would, I would be able to get there. So, Paul not only preached Christ, but he also taught Christ. For in Christ, he says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in chapter 2, verse 3. You know, what is wisdom? I ask that question to myself very often. It is the right use of knowledge. It's just, you have knowledge, all right, but do you have wisdom? You, you know how to use that knowledge? I know people who have a triple doctorates, and when you ask them anything, they don't know. And the most simple thing, they're not street smart, if you know what I mean. Now, they, all they do is think through books. You know, I have a brother-in-law like that. He has, four um, uh, master's degrees, uh, maybe five, I don't know, I've lost count already, but you know, every, every time you talk to him, it's like going into a book, and you say, well, I, I know what the book says, but how would you deal with a situation like this? And again, he goes to the book. You know, the books are good, but the books don't teach you how to move out there very well. You need the experience, and Paul says, I'm here to share with you, not just the truth, but also share with you the experience. So wisdom is the right use of knowledge. So we see first Paul's instruction. Now we have Paul's intent in verse 28. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. And uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, that their hearts, notice here where, where, what he's doing, what he wants to do. He says, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm teaching you, and I'm warning you, for what? That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Again, he's a heavy pack verse. You look at this and say, okay, Paul, wait, 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 wait. 
You know, it's like you're bringing a 10 ton, a 10 ton truck load and just pouring it over you. Hold on, Paul. What are you saying in verse 2? Well, to, uh, to kind of show you where, where you're going with this, it says, I want, this is my purpose, this is where I'm going with this. I want you, I want to present you perfect in Christ. This is where I'm going. Paul, what's your message going to be today? Well, I'm going to give you a lot of teaching, and I'm going to give you a lot of warning, but yeah, what is the conclusion? I want to bring you perfect in Christ. I want, I want to conform, I want to be an instrument to conform you to the image of Christ. I don't just want to load your mind with information. The purpose of this teaching this morning is that you have, you change your ways so that it leads you to completeness. It leads you to maturity. It leads you to become full-grown, mature, complete, perfect. That's my purpose. That's my conclusion. Every time Paul opens a letter, his I know his conclusion. This is my purpose. You know, when you know the conclusion, you know, you, 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 uh, you pay attention. How do you get there? If I told you, for example, okay, we're getting on the bus, and my conclusion is that we reached La Plata del Sol in Madrid. Now, at 6 o'clock, hopefully by 12 o'clock tonight, we'll be in La Plata del Sol. That's the center, it's a kilometer zero of, of the peninsula of Spain, La Plata del Sol. This is where we're going. And you might say, well, how are we getting there? Well, you know, we have one hour from here just to get over Malaga. We'll probably do a stop there. So that's, that'll be the first aim, to get to, uh, you know, to this restaurant where we can have a cup of coffee. Then we get on the bus again, and we do uh, two more hours till we get to San, uh, San uh, Ciudad Real, and we'll probably stop there. Some of you would want to go to the toilet, so we'll stop there for five minutes. And then right after that, we get on the bus again, and then we'll do another couple of hours till we get to the, the outskirts of Toledo. And then we'll probably, you know, and so, okay, okay, now we know the stops that we, but where are you taking us? I'm taking you to kilometer zero of Madrid. Plaza del Sol. So Paul is saying, okay, uh, you see where, where we're going? Do you see what Paul's aim, where Christ's aim is? Is perfection. Listen, this is how, uh, bring this down to this. It is not just about coming to church on Sunday. How many times have I said that? It is not just about getting you to read maybe half an hour, one hour every day. It's not just about that either. It is not, uh, I'm not here just to encourage you, to give you enough uh, motivation so that you can make it back to church on next Sunday. It, it, no, no. The purpose is that we become complete. That we uh, become mature. So that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and all through the week we're, we're, we're experiencing Christ. We're making Christ known through our lifestyle. People can see a true Christian walk and a true Christian talk. And they can identify as, as Christians. Remember in chapter 4, no, in uh, Acts chapter 11, I think it is, it was in Antioch that they called those of the way, that's what they called them before, those of the way, they called them Christians for the first time. And you know who it was that called them Christians? Non-Christians. Non-Christians were able to see these people behaving in a very different way that they were accustomed to. They spoke different. They made decisions based on different things, on different uh, engines, different, uh, uh, you know, the truth. These people function, they make decisions, they live this way because, oh, they're following Christ. Oh, that's, they're Christians. You know, it's good that we can identify ourselves before people and say, oh, I am a Christian. Um, Joichi, the other day, he went to Colegio Maravillas. I happened to hear this from uh, one of the teachers there. And the teacher said, uh, Joichi came and said he was a Christian. And then he went to a real Baptist church and he met the pastor and his wife. And you guys showed up. You know, we know, we have somebody that we know. And, and then she called us and he said, he said that he was a Christian just like you. And, and, and he gave us a chance to say, yes, but what makes that? And he says, and, 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 you are, and you're the priest, he says. She said, he says, no, 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 I'm, I'm not the priest. 
And the pastor, pastor, and she's supposed to be Catholic, she said, pastor, I've never heard that before. You know, uh, you wonder where do they get their information from. But, you know, this is the things that are going on there, and if this lady, who happens to be also Japanese, comes to Christ, it's not because they see a very talented pastor, which I'm not, by the way, uh, or, you know, that, that I'm handsome, that I am, no, I'm not, by the way, <laughs> but that they see Christ. You see where I'm going? It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about you, it's about who we display. And the way Paul made this known, he says, my goal and my method is preaching, warning, and teaching. And then he uses a few words like that their hearts might be comforted, that is, encouraged, confirmed, strengthened. Reinforced. You see, there was a danger there. And Paul says, you know, in front of this danger, you need strength, you need encouragement. And then he says, this being knit together in love, a close unity, a vital, helpful, helpful relationship, being welded together, a unibody. He says, this is how you can make it through. And then this word, unto all riches of the fullness assurance of understanding. That is, I want to enrich you. I want to make you rich. Complete abundance of inward wealth, all riches. Full assurance, confidence, deep conviction, full knowledge of Christ, full assurance. And then to the acknowledgement, that's personal knowledge of the sacred secret. Remember, it talks about the mystery. It says, you know the mystery, you, know, you understand that it's not a myth, but you know, how you, you understand, you know, the mechanisms, how that works. And it's all found in Christ. Enlightened, he also uses that full assurance of understanding as personal knowledge. And to bring this to a close, Paul also speaks about his intercession. Now, what made Paul so effective? You say, well, he's preaching, he's a good preacher. Uh, no, I think what made him so um, effective was his praying. He starts chapter 1, Colossians, saying the first time we heard about you, you know what we did, we got on our knees and started praising the Lord, and the same next thing we did was ask God to make you complete, to give you full knowledge, to give you full understanding. What Paul did was, that the first thing he did in any situation, he got on his knees and said, Lord, this is your job. You're the one that has to do this. We're available for you. Show us. And so we see there in verse in chapter 1, verse 29, and then chapter 2, verse 1, he says this, Thereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, for I would for I would that you knew what great conflict. Of course, that's talking about the, the difficulties that he found. But it, you know, those difficulties were, were conquered on your knees, on his knees. You've all read Ephesians chapter 6, how to be dressed with the full armor. He gives a, a several, several things that you need to put on. And then when you think you have the full armor, then you're ready for battle, right? When you have all the armor, you're ready for battle, right? No, because then in verse 7 he says, praying always. You know when you get into battle is when you're on your knees. So Paul says, I'm, I'm working hard. It's going to be hard work. He says, this is how I do my work. You get the picture. I stop praying. I make sure that the Lord is in it. I make sure that the power that I need to do this work comes from Him. And the only way that that can happen is if I spend time with my Lord. So much more here. But I think I'll leave it there this afternoon. To bring this to a close, Paul shares us again his threefold ministry. My responsibility says I've been given this responsibility to share the gospel. By the way, you know what your responsibility is? To share the gospel. So my ministry is also to suffer for Christ for his sake and fulfill the ministry God has given me. It's going to be difficult, yes. But I do it with pleasure because I know that's going to bring wonderful blessing. I rejoice in this suffering. 
And then he moves on to his third ministry, my biggest ministry. He says, it's not going out and do all the work, it's spending time alone with the Lord. That is where I, I have, um, that's where I get my power from. That's my power source. Sharing the gospel, sharing a suffering for the Gentiles, and then striving for the saints. If I had more time, I'd try to concentrate on a few more bites. But there's so much here. I'll leave that for you. So what do we get in chapter, from chapter 1? We get a lot. First, we see Paul's ministry. First few verses from verse 5 through verse 9 is praying, praying, praying. From verse 11 on, he says, this is how we do it. Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, we, our ministry is done through mega power, the mega power we get from God. Our ministry, we have received the ministry of sharing the gospel. We have a responsibility with the Christian. We have responsibility with the churches. Sometimes I can't sleep, Paul says, because I'm thinking about the trials that the brothers are having in different parts. Sleepless nights for Paul. But they were the best nights because that's the nights that I spent praying. And then he, he shares this strife that he had in prayer for God's people and encourage them to be mature. Every man, that means you and I, have God wants to bring every man to maturity, every woman to maturity. And he wants all of us to share in this, these ministries also. This all stand, I'll leave you with that. Uh, let's stand and have a little prayer. Father, this... Uh, once we open these passages and, as I said before, cut them down into bite-sized pieces and uh, meditate on each bite, we realize how rich these passages are. Only five chapters, Lord, but uh, four chapters, but so full of teaching, so full of warning, so full of instruction. And the thing that caused my attention most tonight is the source of his power, of the power of the Apostle Paul. The only way this church can actually function and move on strong is if we all, not just myself or those who are in leadership, but if all of us will tap in to that mega power source, draw from that Lord, so that once we go into the world, we will be effective. Forgive us, Lord, for the many times that we try to do these things on our own. Sometimes we think we have the answers, and we give the answers, but it reaches nothing. And sometimes when we feel weakest, and we depend more on your strength, just one little word might impact someone enough to bring them closer to Christ. We pray, Lord, that we too, like the Apostle Paul, like Epaphras, who gives us also an example, might go to that sword for power. So that Lord, our ministry can also be effective like Paul's was. And Lord, I know that there's going to be battles in, in the way. We're going to find conflict. Sometimes the conflict comes from inside, from the church. Sometimes it comes from the outside. But the source to be able to solve any conflict comes from the Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us be able to go to that source, that treasure chest, to find the solutions for everything. Help us not just achieve or gain knowledge, but wisdom. That is, know how to use that knowledge in a practical way. And all for the furtherment of your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that you will Take each one of us here this afternoon. Speak to us in a very direct way. If there's anything that's interfering our relationship with you, or anything that's interfering our relationship with anyone else here, I pray that you'll give us the, the way, or the solution, the, the how to, the how to, so that Lord, any obstacle might be removed. The devil would like to keep us divided. But Lord, you want us to be a body uh, uh, fitly joined 
and functioning, Lord, in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope us, Lord, to reach that point. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name.